on. Right, come on, mate. Right, he's ready. Jump in, mate. Get him. Gotcha! Come on! Yes! Well, as you've probably heard, um, this is Cluster, one that I dearly wanted to catch. Um, so like all the fish you're going to see on this DVD, we're going to slide him into the sling first. Oh, he's still angry. Proper fighting machine, this carp is. So this is best practice for getting them out of the water. 90% of damage happens when they're lifted out of the water in the net. So I'm just going to roll the net up and I'm going to slide him into the sling and lift him out of the water in the sling. That's a big fish. There we go. Come on. That's it. Perfect. Okay, I'll check his fins are flat against his body. I'm going to lift him up. See, that one's bent back the wrong way. I've got to get that. You can snap a fin off if the fins are not flat against his body. That was sort of bent back the other way. That's it, it's nice and flat now. Just check it hasn't gone back in that little bit of slack. No, they're nice and flat. And up we go. Oh, Click that on there, mate. I'll hoist him. You uh, read it. No wind ups, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's oh, it's close, mate. Three, eight, almost fifty nine. So fifty eight, twelve. Yeah, it's almost fifty nine on the button, mate. Yeah. 58.12 is fine. 58.12, yeah. Come 58, on. 58.12. <sighs> what a way to start, like, eh? Put it there, Cheers, son. brother. <laughs> <laughs> that is an amazing carp. It is an amazing carp. Come here, fella. Yeah! That's how we do it. Oh, look at that. What a way to start part five of Carp Tackle Tactics and Tips. We're obviously at Gigantica for this part. But we've got other lakes to go to. We're going to go to the Linear Complex. So there's loads of day ticket fishing in England on the pressured waters of Linear. And we're at Sky Lake as well. So you've got a pressured French water, much smaller than this one. Totally different tactics as well. And we've got loads of great guests. We've got part man, part carp, Simon Scott, um, Adam Penning as always. A little bit of Tom Dove. Ali Hamidi is going to be with us as well. And Daryl Peck. And maybe the Swedish wild boar. And uh, as usual, we've got loads of new things to show you. We've got new rods and reels from Daiwa. We've got new bait. We've got new rig items from Calder. Loads of bits that are going to affect your fishing and put loads of these monsters in your landing net. So uh, we're going to do some pictures and then we're going to get on with all that tackle. Wicked. bite indication now for fishing at long range. I'm about 120, 130 yards out here at Gigantica and still you can see I haven't got very heavy bobbins on. It's not wound down real tight because I'm fishing in 20 feet of water. So if you've got a real tight line in that depth, even that far out, 90% of your line is off the bottom, maybe even more than that. The fish come into the swim to feed, they start touching the lines, they're all on edge and I really don't think they like it. So once I've cast out, I sink the line down, leave the tip under the water just with a rod lying there for probably five minutes. So it gets it right down, then pay more off, pay more off, slacken off and then put it on the rest. And then a lot of your line is already near the bottom and only then will I clip on the stow bobbin. So I've got just the small weight that comes with the stow bobbin on there and you can see it's not hanging 
completely underneath. It's sort of half supported by the chain there. So I've got some weight on it, but not loads. These are coupled with the ever faithful Delkims. I wouldn't go anywhere without these. Mega, mega reliable. There's two settings on the Delkim, it's plus and minus. If you put them on plus, it means they go off a bit sooner. It takes less vibration to set them off because they do work on vibration, not on a wheel going round. So I've got them on minus, so there's a little bit more movement before they start to go off, but I've got them on sensitivity six, which is the highest setting. Because I'm a long way out, the movement on the bobbin is going to be less than when I'm fishing close in, because I've got so much line out there. So if we check this out. Yeah, that's going off pretty quickly there. Look, we're only getting that much movement. But even when I've got a crosswind, they're not going off in the wind at all because I've got the right amount of weight on the bobbin. You can unscrew that weight off of the stow bobbins. That's the beauty of injection moulding and you can fish them almost weightless, which I was doing at the start of the session. The wind was off my back. Nothing was happening on the rods at all. And it was nice to have them hanging on there with hardly any weight because they move so much easier. As it's got windy, I've just added that weight on. And if it got really windy, I'd add more weights on, tighten the line up a little bit more so the bobbin's hanging underneath the rod. And that's really how to use them properly. A lot of people think with the stows, you can only use them with slack lines. Not at all. They're actually designed for fishing with a tight line. It's just we prefer to fish slack lines because we're conscious of the fish coming into the swim, touching the line and then spooking. So if you're fishing at long range, that's what I'd recommend to start off with. Increase more weights if they're going off unexpectedly, but try and pin that line to the bottom and I promise you, you get more bites. Well, there we go. The first one of the trip, a lovely gigantic, a scaly one at 22 pounds, taking on our new IB corn tip and a cell hook bait on a choddy hook end trap and the rest as they say was history what a great start to the session and they always start small and get a lot lot bigger This is the first little spot I've been baiting up. My swim is just across there. You can see the brawly in the background. It's a tiny little corner here. It comes in. It's the sort of spot the carp drift in in the afternoons. It's quiet, a little bit of scum in the margins here. And I've been putting a bit of bait on this gravel patch here. I've only done about two hours fishing on this spot. I've been fishing my three rods out into, the, into other areas, but there have been fish coming in here. And earlier in the trip, I saw a couple of proper, proper big fish come in here. And one of them was certainly a good upper 30. So I keep the bait going in here, even though I'm not fishing it a great deal. And if I see the fish come back in, I'll reel in at one of my other rods and just cast across. So I'll put a few bait, baits in here. a few handfuls of tigers, maybe 15 or 20 tigers, just out on the gravel there. It's a lovely little cast from my swim. And then a few boilies as well. This is a really high quality fish meal. So I've been putting a few of these in, sometimes whole, sometimes broken up. I just pop them on the spot as well. Okay, this is my main fishing spot. This is the spot that's done me the most bites so far in this session. It's a classic, classic ambush point for a carp, this is. Just under this bush, there's a pipe that runs under the road that's connected to the lake next door. And there's actually some water running down that pipe. It's not much, only a trickle. Not, we haven't had a lot of rain recently. Um, but it's coming into the lake here, and it's a spot that is always going to attract fish. So if ever you're fishing a lake and there's an inflow, never ignore it, always have a look in there. So you've got that coming in here, you've got a big gravel ridge here, big, big shallow gravel run, nice overhanging tree. It's about a 50 yard cast from my swim. And what I've done is I've clipped up, so I'm landing just short of this bush, and then as the rig drops in, it lands on that gravel run. What I do, we try and have a little look. There's a couple of fish, there's one just going right over the gravel now, right in front of us here really difficult to bait up this spot without spooking them so we just put a couple of nuts in one or two at a time i find this is a great method because if you just put one or two in the fish kind of go whoa something's going on and they just drift out of the way a little bit and that gives you a chance then to put a few more baits in rather than going for a big handful straight off so 
What I don't want to do is create a really tight patch of bait. Casting 50 yards across, landing off that bush, I'm going to land it on that gravel run. And what I want to try and do is just get the fish used to coming in and picking up odd bait. Maybe, you know, no more than maybe 100 tiger nuts at a time, so really quite a small amount. And I'm just scattering them about a little bit. So I want the fish going from one to the next to the next, rather than landing on a tight baited area and really getting intense about grabbing about in the bottom. So I want them picking about. So a few tigers. And just dot a few boilies about on the top of that as well. So I'm kind of going for a dotted feeding pattern rather than a, a heavy sort of load of bait out of a spod. Fish have been really close in round here. They go off out on that tree, and there's quite a big bed of weed be between me and um, the swim. And I've seen fish coming along that today in the sunshine, and coming up up to this area, coming in under this tree by the pipe, milling about, and then drifting on up the margin. So it's it's a key spot on the lake. This is another spot I've been fishing to. This is my middle rod spot, just off these trees. It's a really really carpy corner. This. It's about 80, 85 yards away from the swim. It's a good chuck. And uh, you've got a shallow area here that the carp tend to come into in the afternoons. And I've had, I've had a few bites now off of this spot. I can actually see a couple of my tiger nuts on, the, on this back edge of the spot, but I can't see any a bit further out. So I'm gonna to top up a little bit now anyway. So we'll just put a few more in. Just try and get them out on that gravel where I'm fishing. I think that's enough bait for now in this spot. It's a great way to bait up. I mean, I've got a lot of respect for Adam putting out all that bait with his throwing stick, but if you can, baiting up by hand under trees like this is a lot easier and it's, it's nice and intimate as well. You can really get to see what's going on. Now I need to get back to the swim and get the rods out. Fantastic, talk about quick action. Something Adam Penning said to me a long time ago, if you think you should have had a bite and haven't, reel it in and recast. This rod's been out on that margin over there for about two and a half hours, and I've been around there a couple of times and trickled some bait in, and I've not had a bite, and I've seen fish there, and I, I've seen them feeding as well. So I'm putting in a few tigers, a few crumbed up boilies, and there's fish there feeding, and I'm not getting my string pulled. So I reeled it in, recast it, literally 20 seconds after I put the bobbin on, walk back to the brolly, and we're away. And it looks like a nice one, big fat lumpy one. It's Tara now. Once again, having that lead drop off, fish has fought virtually the whole way in, right on the surface, which is fantastic. There's a big bank of weed in front of me here, but with the lead gone, they're coming over the top of it, perfect. There we go, in she goes. Spot on. There we go. Another little uh, St John's carp. This one's got to be about 18, 19 pound. Big contrast with the fish in this lake. You have big scaly ones and uh, short, fat, round ones like this. But not, and that's what I like. It's the variety that makes it interesting. What I'd like to do now is talk to you a bit about rig camouflage. I've worked in the fish industry for about 17 or 18 years now. And one thing you get to see is that carp have got great eyesight. And I think it's really important to make sure your tackle is pinned down correctly. Well, it's roasting hot. Simon and I are around on the causeway bank, which is out of bounds for fishing, but it's okay for looking and baiting. Um, it's, I don't know how hot it is, but it's hotter than it's been for a while, and the fish have responded, haven't they? Simon? Yeah, they've all come up here on the back of the wind, Adam. The wind's running off down the lake. This is the only flat area in the whole pond, and it's just black with carp, isn't it? It is absolutely thick with them. There's probably 200 or so fish. You've seen them sort of dropping and rubbing there. and Yeah, there's, there's a ridge that runs around here into this little uh, bay and uh, there's some, obviously some quite white clay in there and we've watched several fish really quite quickly and we just come in and, and roll up on that clay and then just carry on on their patrol route you can see the old stripes on them where they've been flicking on the clay right absolutely well the fish that are in front of us sort of lackadaisically enjoying the sunshine are actually very pressure day ticket carp as we've, we've, we know and yeah, um, absolutely they're totally aware of, of anglers and angling pressure and so on and so forth. And I just wanted to sort of get inside your head a little bit on what carp really are aware of, what they can sense, what they can see, um, and what we can do to maybe improve our ch chances as far as their eyesight and things they can well, see. Well, we, we know scientific research has shown that uh, the carp has got fantastic color vision, very good eyesight. 
Uh, it's slightly different to ours. Uh, we, we have binocular vision, we look forward. The carp have got their eyes positioned on the sides of the head so they get much better surround. So they can't see right in front of the nose and they can't see behind themselves, but they get very good peripheral vision round. Uh, we also know they've got very good colour vision. So um, particularly in this sort of water, which is, you, you know, you see, is, is really, really clear. Yeah. Um, you, I think it's safe to say that any carp feeding on these margins has got a very good idea of what it's coming across. It's seeing the hook baits, it's seeing tackle. Uh, and I think it's really important to do everything you can to pin pin your tackle down, make sure you're fishing effectively. We're just going back to colour there. Or are there some colours they can see better than others? Uh, we know in shallow water they've got very good colour vision, not dissimilar to ours. Right. Um, so things like yellow, um, white, that, that would contrast the bottom will stand out a mile to them. Right. You know, so not only good colour vision, but good, good contrast vision Yeah, yeah well. no question. Yeah, right, definitely. Okay. And what about when it gets down deeper? As it gets deeper, the light penetration changes uh, uh, and you get less colours. Uh, so if you're going to fish uh, in a, so with an, a visual approach yeah. in deeper water, then a white pop-up on a dark bottom that will contrast really well. So pretty much what we think would be the case is the yeah. case. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, exactly. so your yellow pop-up, for example, in deep, deep water doesn't look yellow. Right. But in, in sort of five, Still six visible. foot here, you're going to have pretty good colour on the bottom. OK, well, um, you've been fishing a spot just up the bank I here, indeed, which yeah. is it's difficult to fish because it's a tricky cast and it's, as you said, it's, it's very, very clean gravel in shallow yeah. water. So. Um, should we go and have a look and then I'm going to ask you about how you're fishing it and why because I'm sure these guys will find it as interesting as I do. So OK, let's, let's go. Have a look. Well, this is a nice spot, mate. You've had a few bites off here, haven't I you? Have. It's been really productive this session, Adam. I've had a fair lot of bites off that spot. Well, it's, um, it's quite a tricky proposition. I mean, it's ideal for watching them, but I can see straight away that without a bit of thought and care and attention to detail, it's going to be hard to get a bite because everything, you can see the tiniest stone there, can't yeah, you? Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's very shallow, it's clear. You've got the three foot of water, brilliant light penetrations, picking out every stone on the bottom. So what are you doing? What are the key things? What are your priorities in your mind? Because you've, you've watched fish on clear yeah. shelves and that for years. And what are the key things you're trying to do Pin everything. I like to pin everything down. You know, starting coming so how down, are you doing coming that, down yeah? the main line. Well, the first thing is I've got the tubing on. I've got um, dark matter tubing, gravel brown to, to blend with the, the substrate we're fishing over. Uh, I've got a good length of that on. So hopefully, as the line enters the swim, it's it's pinned down by the tubing coming up to the rig. So we, you, when you say that, you're fishing, I guess, a sort of semi slack yeah, line. Yeah, relatively slack. No, I can't fish too slack because I want I want to make sure I get indication from a bite. You're getting drop backs. Yeah, I am. There's snags, snaggy yeast tree. To the right, side. Okay. Um, and then you've obviously got your hybrid lead clip. You've, I've got a dumpy pair on there, uh, and I'm fishing that as I, as I said, drop off style. Uh, but that the pair is is a gravelly coloured pair as opposed to some of the darker ones uh, that call to do. And then the hook link uh, is end trap, uh, soft coated braid, uh, but it's the gravel colour. Okay. Got um, a size six wide gate hook, uh, captor hook, so it's the brown colour. Uh, and then your short hair with your balanced tigers. Well, let, let's take that the other extreme then, just playing devil's advocate. If you, you go back to like how you were fishing in the late 80s, early 90s, and you had the two mil black silicon tube <laughs> and so on and so forth, do, do you genuinely think all the things that you've just said, do you think it really makes a difference or is it a matter of just attention to detail and it doesn't hurt? Well, I think Terry Irwin once said it's the little 1% that make the difference in the whole picture. I think if you're fishing in a spot like this, if you had a blatant rig, you're going to get bites. You know, at the end of the day, the fish could be hungry, they're coming in, they're feeding hard, and you're going to get a pickup. Um, but the more subtle your trap is, the more likely you are to get consistent results. This is a very clear gravel pit. In maybe a farm pond that's really turbid, it's, it's going to make less difference for sure. But still important to, to bear it in mind, all yeah. of the little things that you Pinning said, down your so. tackle, fish as effectively as you can if you're going to maximise your chances of regularly catching fish. OK, excellent. Well, guys, believe me, this guy knows more about carp awareness than anybody else in the game. So listen to what he said, put it into your angling and watch your results improve. So here we go, another cracking St John's fish. It's got to be about £20, this one. I'm really pleased with this one. I like some of the dumpy fat ones. They're good looking characters. I think in this crystal clear water, it's vital to make sure your, uh, your, your rigs and your end tackle are well camouflaged. These fish have got good eyesight, and I think it's vital to get everything pinned down. And I think this is proof that the gear's working all right today. Oh, it's only 25. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is at my end. <laughs> Another creature. Oh. 
He's been having turtles dinners, mate. Just one. Let's have your watch off. Sorry, mate. Get that out of the way. Oh, he's a proper fat one. Yeah, proper fat. Oh, that's five, oh, mate. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what I meant. Is uh, right. I thought he's up a five, though. <sighs> Is it Robert's fish, yeah? Yeah, I thought it thought so. Roberto's fish. Yeah. Yeah, it's 57. This is what we come to Gigantica for. Absolute carp beasts like this. 57 pounds. Let me get him sorted. A carp called Robert's fish and another one taken on the end trap soft, the choddy hooks and a cell hook bait tipped with our IB maze. An awesome, awesome setup. And what we're gonna do now is hand you over to Dan so he can take you through our range of coated hook links and how you can get the best from them so you land in carp just like this Gigantica beast. What a carp. Coated hook links are without doubt the number one choice for carp anglers. I think because it's very easy to use, they're very versatile and they don't tangle. So let's have a look at our range and talk you through when to use each one. So first of all, the Entrap Soft. This is the one that superseded the Hybrid Soft. Basically it's a Dyneema core, so a braided core with a plastic coating on the outside. Comes in three colours. This is the gravel brown one, so perfect for here at Gigantica. There's a weedy green one and a silty brown one as well, so a very, very dark brown. That's brilliant on those sort of places like the old estate lakes and the sort of mirrors where there's loads of silt all over the bottom. It blends in perfectly there. Comes in three braking strains. Ali's using the 20 pound on here. Um, the 15 pound I would use if I was fishing with very small hooks, very small baits, fishing for smaller fish. I'd probably use that because it's a little more subtle. The 20 is a brilliant all-rounder. Like Ali's fishing for 70 pound fish here with no bother whatsoever. Um, but I'd equally, I'd fish for doubles with this one as well. Very, very versatile. And you see on this one, he's fishing it all straight all the way through. So there's no break in it at all. It's right up to the hook and even the knot is out of the coated material. And then he stripped it away at the top of the knot there. So he's got a soft hair basically. So he's combining that with a choddy hook and it's turning the hook and catching hold very quickly. And you see at the other end, he's got a grinner knot tied to a hybrid lead clip. And what's basically gonna happen on the cast, because there's a hinge in the hook link at that point, it's gonna fold back next to the dark matter tubing and that's basically gonna stop it tangling. And you see he's got a big lump of putty in the middle of that. That's molded around a sinker and that just helps everything sink down on the bottom. All these materials sink on their own. But if you put that on there as well, if there's any little contours in the bottom, the hook link will sink into them and it's much, much harder to see if it's pinned to the bottom. Now, I've got a 30 pound version here. That's the end trap soft in 30 pounds. Still quite a fine hook link for 30 pounds. And I know a lot of people use this as their number one choice. There's a guy at Linear at the moment that I know really well, only uses the 30 pound and he absolutely rinses it. And I said, why don't you use the 20 or the 15? He said, the 30 never snaps and it never tangles. So I'm gonna keep using it forever. This one's set up for if I'm fishing at Gigantica or any sort of clean bottom if I'm boily fishing. So it's about eight inches long. I've got a size four cap to curve on there. And a little bit by the hook there, you can see there's a little bit stripped back so that hook can lift up and catch hold. But the hook link's so soft anyway, to be honest, it's gonna move very easily and go up into the fish's mouth, you know, really quickly. And then the next one, which is a new one, lots of people have asked us for this. This is the end trap semi-stiff. So straight away, if I push the hook link together, you can see it's a little bit stiffer than the soft. So basically it's gonna push the hook bait away from the lead that little bit better. Still a brilliant all-rounder. You can use a soft anywhere. You can use this pretty much anywhere as well. I'd probably avoid it in really heavy weed just because it can come to rest and because of the stiffness of it, the bait can end up sitting up in the weed. Then I'd wanna to go to a softer hook link. But for absolutely everything else, this is brilliant stuff. Again, comes in three braking strains, 15, 20 and 30, and three colours as well. The gravel brown, the weedy green as we've got here, and then the silty brown as well. And then finally, the one that's been in the range the longest, my personal favourite, the hybrid stiff. Even better for anti-tangle, this one because of the stiffness of the coating and pushes everything away from the lead better than all the others just because of that stiffness. You can see I've got a bit of putty on there just to sink it down and pin it to the bottom. And on this particular one, I've stripped a bit back near the hook so the hook can lift up and catch hold. And that's really important with stiff coated hook links. There should be some kind of break in them so that the hook can lift up, 
turn and catch hold. And then I've got the old favourite rig ring on there and a bit of shrink tube as well to help that cap to curve turn over. And then at the other end, I've crimped it on using our crimp. You could tie a half blood knot or a grinner in that, but because it is stiff, it is a little bit harder to do. So by crimping it, just makes the whole job easier and it's very, very strong as well. So that's the range of coated hook links from Calder. We pay great attention to the colours. We take samples of actual lake beds and match them perfectly to them. They're all rigorously tested by all the boys at Calder. So they're really put through their paces before you ever use them. And the basic rule of thumb is the softer and choddier the bottom, the softer the coated hook link, the cleaner the bottom, the stiffer the hook link you should use. Well, I'm playing yet another hard fighting Gigantica carp on one of the new 13 foot three and three quarter DF infinities. Um, the 12 footers have been so popular um, that we've managed to persuade Daiwa to bring out the old 13 foot Magnum taper, but in the new styling. So the matte black finish on the rods, 50 mil butt rings as far up the butt section as they'll go. Um, and uh, low key whippings, all black whippings, nice slim handle, um, basically to look as much like a custom built rod as you can get. And this three and three quarter is a man's rod. This is a proper long range tool. And if you're an overhead thump caster, you will get even further with a 13 foot rod. If you're good with a 12 and you cast overhead, a 13 will go even further and uh, don't have to be a big guy to cast these. Um, Damien at Calder loves the 13 footers and if he's got to go an extremely long way that's the one that he chooses. Um, and they've also put a three and a quarter test curve into the range which is a beautiful fishing rod. Um, if I was going to be fishing up to sort of 130, 140 yards maximum then uh, the three and a quarter would be a beautiful rod. Um, same sort of fast action so it bends mostly in the tip and uh, I've actually cast both of these as prototypes and found there's only a few yards in it really um, it's only when you start getting into the real big casters that are using big leads that it starts to make a real difference and uh, the other thing about 13 foot rods is they do lift the water lift the line off the water a bit quicker um, so if it's weedy and stuff it does get the line away from the weed a bit sooner I'm just uh, trying to concentrate on the fish as well because it feels like a reasonable one. They always do in this deep water. But uh, as with all fast taper rods, just keep the rod high, let the tip of the rod do the work, take your time in the fight and you should have no problems whatsoever. So these are the new 13 foot infinities and uh, if you like casting, they're going to go an extremely long way. At this point, just let the, let the tip of the rod do the work. Don't be afraid to give it a little bit of line. What a lot of people do wrong at this point is wind, oh, is wind too much. Just keep it on a fairly long line because you've got to get the rod behind you to net it. Come on, fella. All right, nice and easy. I can see he's well hooked. Yes, got him. Another one on a 13 foot infinity. And there he is, a 27 pounder. Bit of a weird one, this one. Tiny little fins on him, but fought really, really hard. Long range fishing is extremely demanding. You're putting all your kit under maximum stress and it's when you can get problems. It is an art form and there's a few simple steps to doing it quite easily. So first of all, the rod and reel combination. Nothing more important than that. The rod is the most important thing. I'm using a 13 foot, three and three quarter infinity, one of the new ones in the range. If you're not used to long range fishing, I wouldn't get this one too long, too powerful, and you're not going to compress it. Start off with a 12 foot rod, I would say probably a three and a quarter infinity or even a three and three quarter infinity, or the new three and three quarter longbow X, 
they would be the ones to start off with. They're really, really fast recovery, which means when you cast, the rod snaps back straight as quickly as possible, quicker than any other rod I've ever used. 50 mil butt ring, absolutely essential as well. Big rings all the way down the rod. That's really important. And also the handle. You see, it's quite a long handle. If it's just under my armpit there, so basically the wider your hands are apart, the easier it is to move the tip of the rod. If you've got a short handle, it's much harder to cast. So these come as standard with a longer handle. And then the reel, not as important as a rod, but still important. That's the old famous Bazier that I've been using for years. Really put these ones through their paces. A long spool, brilliant line lay, absolutely flies off of there. Now, if you can't afford that, I'll go down probably to a wind cast, something like that. That's probably half the money. Tournament ISOs as well, and the new Cross Cast X. All will cast an extremely long way. What you're getting out of one of these is less weight and a longer spool. So if there's no budget, I'd get one of those. But if money's tight, I'd scale down and just get one of the cheaper Daiwa reels. They're all brilliant. Okay, the rig. That is the next most important thing. The right rig is going to cast further. Now you see here we've got the cog system on. So the swivel is in the side of the lead, so they're picking the lead up from the heaviest point. Very effective for hooking, not the best casting lead. It's not far off of an inline, which is also not a brilliant casting lead. Better than this would just to be use a lead clip and have the hook link going behind the lead clip on the cast. What this is gonna do is pull the lead off course on the cast because it's attached to the nose. Not as much as an inline, but it still will cut it down. If you want to cast the absolute maximum distance, then you want the lead on the end of the line, just like a sea angler, so you should be using a helicopter rig. And in my opinion, the only two really safe helicopter rigs are on a short length of lead core where the beads pull off the end, or a safe zone leader, again, where the beads pull off the end. And then moving on to the line here, this is the new tapered subline. So we've got a leader at either end of it, this one is 30 pound going down to 10 pound with no knot at all. So it just effortlessly goes off the rod. You've got no knot clattering through the rings. You haven't got to worry about where the knot is before you cast out. For me now, there's no reason to use a shock leader when you've got something like this. If you crack it off, you just turn it round. So wind it onto another spool and you've got another leader at the top. So you've got two goes on every single spool. So that's the kit. Let's have a look at how to cast the rod. So first of all, wind the lead so it's roughly half the length of the rod so where the spigot is it wants to be roughly opposite the spigot and you have it there every single time we do a lot of kids fishing schools and that's one of the things they do wrong one minute the lead's up by the rod tip next it's really down low you've got to have it in the same position every single time so that for me is about right so you make sure that's locked up and then the reel wants to be screwed up as tight as you can get it you don't want that, that clutch to be slipping on the cast. That wants to be screwed up properly, properly tight. If we're going for absolute extreme distance, I'd even move the spool up. So in this situation, just turn this off and do that. And then wind it back up again. So the spool is as far forward as possible. And that means when the bail arm's open, there's less drag for the line coming off the spool. So that's all bang, ready to go. Next thing to do is wet the line. I do that before every big cast. That will stop 99% of problems. If you've got too much line on the reel or it's too dry, too much comes off in one go, it wraps around the butt ring and cracks off. And people go, oh, I'm snapping the leader. I'm, I'm snapping it on the cast. You're not. It's wrapping around the butt ring and it's snapping itself. If you blow the leader up, halfway through the cast it will snap, which means you put so much force on it, you've actually snapped the leader. If it goes, if it goes crack and goes sailing out there, I promise you it's wrapped around the butt ring, so there's something wrong at this end. Right, so my stance. All my weight is going to start off on my back foot. Yeah, a lot of people you see their weight starts off on their front foot, so there's no body weight in the cast whatsoever. So everything on the back foot, pick up the line with your finger, and you see there I've got a brand new calder item. That's a neoprene finger stall that just slips onto your finger. Just protects your finger from the line cutting in, and I promise you it makes you cast further, because you can't feel as much on your finger you hit the rod harder. Right, so I'll just check the line's not tangled around the tip of the rod. Check behind me. Just take a step forward in the swim. Arm extended up. And then rod up, the same angle as the line. And that's gone. Don't think it's actually clipped up this rod. 
that's gone probably 130 yards with ease. And you see I started off on the back foot, went through onto the front foot, kept the rod up at the same angle as the line. A lot of people, the rod's down here and you can see the line coming straight off up the tip or the rod's back there and you can see the line going forwards off the tip. You're just creating extra drag, which slows the cast down. So let's just tighten down, wind the line through the water just to keep it wet all the time and then back in again. When you're holding the rod, you want two fingers either side of the stem of the reel. That is the absolute strongest way to hold a rod. If someone was trying to get that rod off you, that would be the toughest way you could hold it. And the same on the end of the rod, that wants to really grip it. You see people holding the rod like that, you want to really grip the end of the rod and you're pulling with your left hand as you're pushing with your right hand. A lot of people when they're casting, this hand's doing hardly anything. So let's go for it again. On my back foot, just check behind me. Not tangled around the tip. Arm extended. <laughs> and that's at least 130 again with very little effort. And with casting, practice makes perfect. Go to a lake where you're not annoying anybody else. Cast, 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 and I promise you, you'll get further. So if you basically put everything that I've shown you into practice, you've got the right kit, you've got the right line, the right rig, and you use that same technique, you'll be getting miles as well. Well, you got him in quick, Si. Yeah, he's coming all right, this one. Definitely. It's, it is a good one, isn't it? Yeah, you can see the old leads come off, which has helped me out on the weed. Right, okay. Perfect. Well, we're going to have a look at your rigs in a minute. I see you've caught that on a tiger nut, a short hook link, and a drop off lead. Yeah, right? one of my favourite setups. I've caught a few fish on tiger nuts. I'm a great fan of tigers. If they're prepared properly, they're an absolutely brilliant bait. Well, he certainly liked them, mate. Excellent. Well, we'll have a look at your rigs next. Well done. Thank you, sir. Caught this fish on my uh, favourite balanced tiger nut rig, and I'm going to show you that now. Start with the main line. This is 20 pound subline in brown. It's really strong line, and I've got an enormous amount of confidence in it. It's uh, a weedy lake, and there's some snags around the margins. I want to make sure if I'm fishing into a tricky situation that I've got a main line that's up to the job. I have yet to be let down by this stuff. It's, it's the line of choice for me all the time now. I use it loads. It casts beautifully as well for a 20 pound line. It's amazing stuff. Coming down the, uh, into the main components of the rig then, I've got some dark matter uh, tungsten tubing in gravel brown. I'm a great fan of anti-tangle tubing uh, and I like to use a length uh, as long as I can get away with really for casting. So we've got over two foot on this section here. Now this stuff is brilliant and it sinks like a concrete block. It's very, very heavy. So I cast out, the tubing will flop to the bottom uh, and by the time I've just teased the line back, I'm gonna get that tubing line right along the gravel that I'm fishing over in there. Then we've got a tail rubber pushed onto a hybrid lead clip. I don't push these on too tight as I've, uh, I'm a big fan of the drop off lead system. Uh, and what I want to achieve when I'm fishing this setup is that the fish feels the weight of the lead as it kicks off from the spot, the lead drops away. And that means I'm playing a fish without a lead interfering uh, during the fight. And in this weedy water here at St John's, I think that's a huge bonus. So there's my hybrid lead clip system, tail rubber, and a dumpy pair, which is gravel brown. So as soon as that fish kicks, the lead's gone. From the hybrid clip, we've got a little link clip, and then I've got N-trap, soft coated braid in gravel brown, and I've got a length there, maybe of 15, 18 centimeters. I've stripped the end of that back, and with some shrink tube I've created a curved extension to a size 6 wide gate. This is a setup I've got an enormous amount of confidence in. I've caught fish. If I had one rig for the rest of my days this would be the one. It's just so reliable. I've added to that a little bit of dark matter uh, putty on that uh, hook link. It's really important for two reasons. Firstly it makes sure that, that hook link is lying flat on the floor. We're fishing for fish that are very pressured here at St John's. They've seen it all. They see, you know, on a busy weekend, bank holiday weekends, every swim on the lake's taken. These fish are under enormous amount of pressure, and I think they're acutely aware of end tackle in the swim. So I need to do everything I can to make sure that my fishing equipment is lying flat on the bottom of the pond. So sinking tubing, hook link pinned down with a dark matter putty on the, on the, 
the hook link. The other thing I think this lump of dark matter does on the hook link is it helps the rig mechanics to work. As the fish picks up that bait, the dark matter putty drags that hook link round and down and therefore the hook is hopefully catching in the bottom lip of the fish. Okay, so there's the size six wide gate hook and there's a hook bait situation here. I'm using a, a balanced tiger nut setup that I've got enormous confidence in. So the setup I like to use is I use a small tiger uh, first on the hair and above that I put a larger tiger nut and what I've done with the top tiger nut is I've drilled it out, I've cored it out with an old drill bit and then I pushed a cork insert into it. And what I like to try and achieve when I'm fishing this setup is it not to be a pop-up but just for it to slowly sink. So ideally I want this to sit on the bottom of the lake with the hook kicked over so just, just buoyant. So it would be a little bit more buoyant than the free tigers in the swim and the, hook, the, the weight of the hook is completely gone. So a fish coming in, it's not seeing a pop up blatantly two inches off the bottom, but that there's a tiger nut sat there which is pinned to the bottom by the weight of the hook and hopefully it's, it's really visual just sitting there and when the fish sucks that in, the rig is in the prone position straight away. So a deadly setup and if I, you know, one rig, one setup to go pretty well anywhere, any busy day to get water, this would be the one. 100% confident. Well, this really is an absolute cracker. 21 pound of stunning, stunning St. John's Common. Beautiful, beautiful dark common. It's absolutely lovely looking fish. Really pleased with this one. And yet more proof that my balanced tiger nut rig is really working well today. Well, there you go, guys. How about that? An absolute cork in mirror carp. St. John's Pool, 19 pounder. Really, really pleased with this guy. Caught on the leg core rigs. I'm going to show you how to use leg core safely. Vitally important that you do so. If you're going to use leg core, you've got to use it right. I'll show you how to do that next. Okay, we're moving on to leg core rigs, how to fish them safely and how to use it in combination with the chod rig, which is the, the general pairing of the two. Uh, the key thing, guys, with leg core, um, there's a few things that you must, must, must bear in mind. First of all, don't use really long lengths, um, four or five feet at the absolute outset, you know, that's, that's as much as you're going to need. Um, secondly, do not fish leg core with low diameter, low breaking strain lines. I use it with 20 pound subline or 15 pound subline, um, which is 0.4 and 0.43 respectively. Um, if, I'm, if I'm fishing at long range, 15, you know, 100 yards, I never fish further than that really anyway. Um, and, uh, and for most of my fishing in the summer, the weed's up, 20 pound subline. It sinks brilliantly, it's tough, and you're not gonna be losing tackle. So that's the key thing, fish safe and fish strong when you're using leg core, good reel line that's, that's really up to the job. Don't use long lengths. I'm using, uh, this is actually a version of the rig that I've uh, caught the fish on on this session. So I'm gonna talk you through what's going on here and a few of the key features. This is um, green, weed green cable leg core, which is one of our new products. Um, it changes colour throughout its length um, and when, when it's wet, if you drop it in the edge, it tones really, really well with different types of weed growth because it does fade in and out. It's got that sort of mottled appearance. Very, very strong, sinks well and it's very, very supple as well. You can see how soft this rig is. You know, it will, it will genuinely will follow the contours of the lake bed. The lead, first of all, this is a, a, a one and a half ounce swivel pair. Cut the swivel off. Generally, you want to be using the smallest lead that you can get away with on this type of rig. Now, I've spliced one of our uh, small quick links onto the end of that, and that's used for um, quick change the lead. I may occasionally go up to a two, never any bigger, and I may go down to a 1.1, um, depending on the distance that I'm fishing. So that's spliced onto there, lead's attached there. Next, I've got a weedy green heli rubber, which sits down like that, makes everything nice and neat. And then coming up the leg core, we've got one of our new barrel beads. Um, this is a prototype, so I'm not sure when you'll see these, but it's designed to grip the lead core um, so that you can, if you're fishing a short hook link, it will keep the hook away from the lead. And it slides, when you, put, when you hook a fish, it just slides down and locks against there, like so. As you can see, if you didn't have that and it was just sat there, then your hook point is very close to the lead. When you're winding it in, it can occasionally blunt the hook point. So it just gives you that bit of separation. So I set the bead about there. Next, we've got a running section. 
which on my rigs I've got a running section of about three, three to four feet. So I'm setting the top bead right up near the end of the lead core. Now, if you're going to do that, that means that your rig is going to settle nicely over the weed, but you need to fish it with a very, very slack line, obviously, because you don't want the part of the lead core lifting off the bottom and then raising your rig up off of the bottom. It's very, very important. So very slack lines are essential with this kind of presentation. So before we actually get to the chod section that's running happily up and down there, we're going to look at the safety part of the top of the rig, which is the key, the key part of this, really. Now, again, this is, uh, these are prototype components. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you this first of all, that is the sleeve. You can see it's a tapered sleeve, very, very thin at one end, very, very thick at the other. The reason for that is that when the swivel is running up, now let's imagine this is a lost rig and the fish has got the hook link and you, he's got to free himself. He's got to be able to shake the lead and the lead core and get rid of it and just be left with the hook link, which he will get rid of in his own time. But very important, the fish can get rid of the leader. So, the thin part is to allow the swivel, uh, the, or the ring swivel rather, to run up onto the sleeve like that. You don't want it to jam and lock as, as some bits of tubing can do, so it runs up nice and easy onto there. And then the thick part is where the bead sits down over the top like that. It's designed to be a tailor fit. Now, if you look down the barrel of the thick uh, of the bead, you'll see a very, very big bore. Absolutely critically important because that means it will just absolutely fly off the end of the leg core over any knot, uh, even bits of weed, very, very easily. Um, I've landed a couple of fish when these have been right up the line, even when there's been weed and so on over the knot. So it does genuinely fly off very, very well. Now you might think, uh, as we did when we got this far, that that's probably as safe as you can get with a leg core rig, um, but not so. Uh, at Corda, we've taken it another level. Um, we've got a component which I'm going to show you now. Very, very simple. It's just a prototype um, and we're playing around with it. You might see it out in 2012, but we believe that this is going to make lead core um, safety or take lead core safety to a whole other level. So I'm going to take that bead off. I'm going to put on the new bead. Just moisten that down before I do. Okay. So there you've got the same sort of uh, combination. You've got the tapered sleeve with, um, with the bead on top. So you're thinking probably, how on earth can that be safer um, uh, than what we already started with? Well, the magic of this is when the rig hits it, prepare to be amazed at the simplicity and effectiveness of this. When the rig hits it, the bead just falls away. It's a disappearing upper chod bead. Now, you can't have anything safer than that. A nice big ring from the ring swivel, <laughs> that's going to come off absolutely easily, even if there's weed on the end of the leader. So look out for those in the future from Corda. We're working on developing those components. We're also patenting them and protecting them um, so that we, we don't get copied. Um, really excited about those. Those beads, you know, we think they're going to make rigs a lot safer. And if you're looking to use lead core rigs, um, helicopter rigs, chod rigs, um, anything like that in 2012 onwards, then look out for those beads and the barrel beads and the sleeve components because they really do take safety to another level. There you go guys, that's proof of uh, safe lead core rigs working well. Use them as I've showed you and uh, let's look after these beautiful creatures. Really pleased with this one. Okay guys, this is um, the current uh, incarnation of the stiff hinge rig. It's really nothing like the original version. I've just tweaked it and uh, modified it for my own use. Um, so starting at the hook end, um, I've got a size 6 choddy and you can see that I've, I've curved that um, right round um, to a section of 25 pound mouth trap. Once you get used to tying the mouth trap, I mean it's, it's the easiest stiff material to tie, um, that's why it's out there. It's also tinted so it blends in really well with the underwater environment. It's easier to tie, as I said, than any other stiff material out there in my experience. So um, I use the 25 pound, it's supposed to be a stiff rig by its very nature, 25 pound is thicker and stiffer than the other one, so that gets my vote. Size 6 choddy, as I said, and I'm whipping that on using uh, Danny's whipping um, style knot, which is, I'm not sure if it's a dom off or what, but it's, uh, it certainly seems to sit better than the standard knotless knot, so have a look at how I tie that and give that a go. Um, I've got a, a little D on the back of the hook uh, with a, a mini uh, medium rig ring, uh, and that's blobbed. About five turns on the whipping knot, 
and um, and then as, as I like to do I've, I've curved that very very aggressively like so using the side of my thumb um, no need to use steam or anything like that with mouth trap it, it behaves really well does what you tell it pretty much first time if it doesn't then the easiest thing to do if you've got a little kink or it's not quite sitting how you want it the best thing to do is to stretch it back out get it nice and straight and start again and it's like a blank sheet of paper and then you can recurve it um, so the curve very very important what I try to do what I'm looking for is when the pop-up is above the hook that serves, serves its main purpose which is obscuring the hook it makes it completely invisible from above but when the, the pop-up is holding that in the water you want the point of the hook to be parallel to the lake bed so I don't want it sitting like that and I don't want it sitting like that I want it dead parallel like that so the curve the shape of the curve is critically important it's also important to have an area in, inside here which is going to give you enough gape to the rig because it's really like a giant hook and you want enough gape in here to hook the fish in the, in the middle of the bottom lip. If you close the gape down, for example, and had it like that, you will start to lose fish. So you want a bit of separation, a bit of space there in your curve so that the fish's lip can go in here. Um, that's the top part of it. It comes down to um, my little small loop which I plagiarise from other anglers, um, they, they definitely got it right. Makes a big, big difference to the rig. Gives it 360 degree, mo degree movement. And the purpose that serves is that no matter which direction the fish comes from, when it approaches your rig, the, the bait is gonna spin round and be taken into the mouth. Now, if the fish is sucking at it, and you, you can test this yourselves. You drop it in water with a, a balance pop up, prod it with a needle, and it will spin round like a, a, a wheelie gig. And, or a whirly kick as I used to call them and uh, that means that wherever the fish comes from you're going to nail it in the middle of the bottom lip. I've proved this in, in, in quite a few hits of fish that I've caught where every fish repeatedly is nailed dead centre of the bottom of the lip. Out of every rig that I've ever used this is the best hooking rig bar none. Consistent hook holds. Um, I used this on one session where I caught 34 carp, big ones, and I didn't lose a single fish. So the loop very very important. That's coming down to a size 11 ring swivel, which again is just adding to movement. It's mounted on a small loop, which is tied into the end of the uh, end trap. Um, so if we just go back to the end trap, boom, and work back down the rig from that way. Um, tied this to a size uh, eight ring swivel. Uh, when it's tied to the swivel in this fashion, you can use it inside a lead clip. Um, if you're using a hybrid lead clip, uh, as, I, as I would, my preference, like this, then I would just fish it with anti-tangle tubing, dark matter tubing, tungsten, very, very heavy, camouflaged, tail rubber, and a leg clip. Obviously, if you're using that, then you can tie your boom of the end trap section direct to that. If you're not, then that will fit inside one of our leg clips very tidily. Pin will go through the eye, or it will click in place if you're using one of the other ones. And if you want to use this on a helicopter rig, all you need to do is put the ring onto the leg core leader and tie it so that the end trap is tied to the eye of the swivel. So they're the variations, but for, for the purposes of this, I've tied that off like so, so that would go inside a leg clip. I've got a 30 pound end trap boom. Now it's end trap soft. The purpose of that is um, serves several purposes actually. Uh, the main one being that it's super strong, very, very durable. It's got enough stiffness so that with a critically balanced bait, it will boom away from the lead so it won't land in a heap like so. It will just do that and settle nicely in, in a straight line. Blends in superbly with the underwater water environment. This is the, the weedy green. I've got a figure of eight loop knot at the top end, just a small loop for the ring swivel to run on just to give it even more movement to the hook link. And then I've molded the dark matter putty um, around the knot of the loop and that putty should be just enough so that the rig is critically balanced. I've taken fish to well over 35 pounds on this rig. Um, it's one that, that has served me well. Um, in fact, most of my big fish have been caught on this. Uh, so yeah, give it a go. This is my variation of the stiff hinge. Very, very effective rig. Well, that's what we call wood carving of a common. Just over 19 pounds. I caught this fella on a chod rig. They aren't the be all and end all of rig presentations, but use them in the right place, they're very effective. I'll show you how to tie them up next. 
Okay guys, the rig that I'm using on this session is uh, the ubiquitous Chod rig. Um, it's a bit overused and it's, it's wrongly used in my opinion quite a lot these days. So I'm going to show you exactly how I use it um, and talk a little bit about why I'm using it. This is the most reliable hook I've ever used. Hook pulls and fish losses are very, very rare. Um, so I'm using a size 6 Choddy um, and I'm coupling that with 25 pound mouth trap to make the stiff section. So. 25 pound mouth trap which I'm whipping to this size 6 choddy using um, a whipping knot that Danny showed me. Don't know if it's got a name, it's similar to a Domhoff but it's not quite the same but watch how I tie it. It does give you a better presentation than a knotless knot. I didn't used to believe that was true. I've used a knotless knot for years and years um, but this, this just makes everything sit a little bit straighter and a lot neater. So I've used that whipping knot five or six turns uh, or four to six turns and then in the usual way I've uh, placed a, a medium sized uh, rig ring onto the tag end, passed it back through the eye, blobbed it with a lighter and then pressed the end flat so that it's kind of mushroom headed which means it sits back into the hook eye nice and neatly. Okay now before we get on to the, how this is curved um, we're going to talk about the attachment, the bottom end of this rig now. It's a size 11 ring swivel, um, one of our nice black ones. Now this, this is um, uh, gives two, two properties really. The ring goes onto the leader which means it's nice and safe and it's got plenty of movement if it needs to come off the leader um, and it also helps give movement to the rig. This loop, watch how I tie it, you know, using um, uh, one of our puller tools, if you tie it around the shank of the puller tool using a two turn twice tucked blood knot, pull it down but don't pull it down tight until you're right at the end because otherwise the knot will bite in halfway down and it'll mark the hook link. So get it down, gather it up around the shaft of the puller tool, make sure the swivel is on the inside of the knot, not the outside. Very, very important because when you pull this tight, the eye of the swivel can bite into the plastic and the line at the back of the puller. So get the swivel round on the inside, stretch it out using a, 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 a swivel lead over the point of the hook, place that over, stretch it out and get everything nice and tight bedded down. Pull the tag end tight with your teeth, um, and then trim it off and um, you'll have a very, very straight section. Now imparting the curve into the rig, how I do that, very, very important. I use the edge of my thumb and the tip of my forefinger and I just pull it over my thumb like so and you'll find that mouth trap behaves beautifully and gives you the curve and the shape that you want first time of asking. If for any reason you're not getting the shape that you want, all you need to do is stretch it out again as you did when you originally made the rig, gives yourself a, a blank sheet of paper in effect and it, it, a straight rig can then be curved again a lot more easily than one that's got a slight kink in it that you're trying to take out. Now what I'm looking for is I want the hook point to be parallel with the lake bed when the pop-up is attached, when everything's in position. So I want it sat pretty much like that. I don't want it sat like that and I don't want it sat like that. It needs to be parallel like so. Now the other key part of this, you need some space in here for the fish's lip to go. Now if you tie the rig or curve the rig rather with it closed like that you're not, you've not got enough room to hook fish and you'll probably have hook pulls. You need a bit of space like so for real big fish you know they've got a big bottom lip. Curve it out like that. Now the lip goes in there now, believe me guys, this is the best hooking rig of any rig I've ever used. So that's how I tie the choddy. Nice big curve, get the point parallel to the lake bed, ring swivel, little loop, big curve, 25 pound mouth trap. That is the best hooking rig I've ever used. Well, how about that? Not many have got names in St. John's, only the big ones, but if I was gonna christen this fella, I'd call him the fighting machine, absolute warrior really beat me up, took about 30 yards of line on his first run and you can see why, look at that rudder. Really pleased with this guy, nailed on a chod rig, exactly how I showed you to tie them up. Give it a go, use it in the right situation, it really is effective. Okay guys, a lot of you are fishing weedy waters just like this one. Getting fish uh, bedded down in weed is part of the territory, you know, and we do all we can, dropping the lead, etc. There's a, a few things you can do to put the odds in your favour. First of all, good strong line. I'm using 20 pound sub line. You don't want to be losing any tackle no matter what. 
when you get a fish that beds you down like this, I've always found that the best thing to do is just be patient, keep a good healthy bend in the rod and just wait. And invariably, you'll feel a fish kick. Sometimes maybe after 10, 20 minutes, if you're patient, you'll wait, it will kick. And then as soon as you feel it moving, get it up in the water and keep it coming and, uh, and hopefully that should be it. But you don't want to be pointing the rod at the fish or pulling for a break or just be patient, keep a bend in the rod and the fish will probably get bored before you. That's how to land them in thick weed, that's how I land them. Hopefully this guy will come in now, I've said that. That was a heart stopping fight, saw the big tail. Look at that rudder on the surface when the fish hit the surface early on in the fight. They've all been doing that guys and if you're fishing in, in weedy areas, it's good advice to keep your clutches locked down pretty much so they've got a battle to take line on the bite because if you're in your bivvy and a fish takes 10 yards through a weed bed, you're not gonna get it in. So fish sensible, you stick strong line. Like I said, I'm using 20 pound sub line. You can easily cast 100 yards with that. You, know, you, you don't compromise uh, on your tackle, fish strong fish safe in weed for big fellas like this and uh, be patient during the fight like I showed you and I'm sure you'll get them in like I did this fella. Really made up with this. <laughs>